Hello, Society members and our viewers from around the world. My name is Charles Knippen. I'm the president of the National Society of Leadership and Success. I'm happy to be hosting another Thought Leader series with you today. During this series, we sit down with world leaders and we give you the opportunity to learn from them, to hear their stories, and to learn their tips for success. And today, I am joined by a leader with an unparalleled service commitment in the public sector. He is the former U.S. Secretary of Defense. He is a former director of CIA. He is also an officer in the Air Force. He was also president of Texas A&M University, Chancellor of William & Mary, and also in 2013 was named the president of the Boy Scouts of America. For over 50 years, he has been serving the public, but also the greater good. Today, I'm very happy to be hosting this session with Dr. Robert Gates. Dr. Gates, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Well, let's jump right in. During this uh, series, we want to get your story. So if we could go back in time, um, you know, for a lot of our viewers, they are students, traditional age students, and we like to take you back to that time frame. Can you kind of give us the story of what were some of the critical moments for you, some of the critical decisions you made to get you from a student to where you are today? One of the questions that I often get from students is, how do I get from where I'm sitting to where you're sitting? And I like to take them back to when I was sitting where they are as a grad student I think one of the mistakes a lot of young people make nowadays is trying to plan everything too carefully and you just never know when different opportunities may arise and I like to say opportunity knocks but it doesn't uh, knock the door down and so grad student uh, CIA's recruiter is uh, on campus at Indiana University uh, where I'm uh, getting a graduate degree in Russian and Soviet history and, uh, and I decided to sign up for an interview with the CIA recruiter. I had every intention of using the interview, if I got the interview, uh, to get a free trip to Washington, D.C. I had no intention of going to work for CIA. I had no intention of making a career of it. I just thought it would be a great way to get a free trip to D.C. Well, one thing led to another. All of a sudden, I'm, at, um, I'm in CIA. Uh, I serve in the Air Force. Uh, CIA had a special program. It was during Vietnam. They gave no draft deferments, so you had to go into the Air Force, get commissioned. Very great incentive to be successful in officer training school because if you flunked out, you went straight to Vietnam as an airman basic. So it was highly incentivized. And then when I started at CIA, I went, I went back to Georgetown or went back to school at Georgetown University to get a PhD because I had no intention of making a career of CIA. Literally within two weeks of getting my PhD in 1974, I got an invitation from Henry Kissinger and Brent Scowcroft to join the National Security Council staff as the Soviet desk guy. And my bosses at CIA said, there probably won't be a job for you when you come back. So the first lesson that I would offer from my life is I took a risk. I said, well, this looks interesting, I'm going to go do it. And I never really saw myself as a career person at CIA, but I, people just kept offering me interesting things to do. So I think that the, the sort of the fundamental lesson from, from my story is um, the willingness to take a chance, to understand that the only way you really get ahead is to take risks from time to time, sensible risks, but risk nonetheless and to be open to uh, opportunities that seem to come from nowhere and which were never part of your plan and then you end up someplace else. I have one final example. I had no connection with Texas A&M University and when the first President Bush called me, he, his museum and library is at Texas A&M and they have a School of Government and Public Service, a grad program, a master's program at A&M. And he said, we, we need an interim dean, because it was a brand new school. We need an interim dean. Um, would you be willing to do this? It's only a day or two a month for nine months till we hire a permanent dean. Well, it ended up being two weeks a month for two years. But I got to know A&M. They got to know me. Lo and behold, I'm asked uh, to be a candidate for president of the university. I become president of Texas A&M. I never anticipated being the president of a university. And I think had I not been president of Texas A&M and a little bit in the limelight, 
I'm not sure I would have ever been asked to become Secretary of Defense. So doing a favor for a friend, being willing to become the interim dean of the Bush School, leads to a whole, at a, at a fairly advanced point in my life, leads to a whole new set of opportunities and, and uh, challenges that I never anticipated. So I think, I think that the key in all of this, in addition to being willing to take a risk, is to be open to new paths that weren't part of your plan and you never know where they'll lead. So have a great plan, but always be open and making sure. Yeah, and I would tell, and I would tell young people, I say, you know, the, 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 the harsh reality is you've got to do all the hard work of preparation. And you may or may not be extremely successful, but if you don't do the preparation, you won't be successful. That's just a guarantee. Wise words. And, you know, the couple of things that you were just mentioning as far as looking for opportunity, taking risks, um, being open, uh, those are things that you captured in a 50-year career here in your book, the passion, A Passion for Leadership. And so, um, you know, jumping right into that book, one of the things that struck me right away was your dedication at the very beginning. You dedicated the book to those who serve the public good. Can you tell us the inspiration behind that and the inspiration behind the book? One of the major reasons that I wrote the book was uh, I really didn't decide to do it until I was asked to stay on by President Obama. And then I realized I ended up with this uh, rather extraordinary uh, group of experiences that involved leadership of major organizations and in particular in every one of them leading change and leading reform, making them better than they were, trying to adapt them to new circumstances, uh, and, um, and trying to take care of the young people in my charge, uh, particular, whether it was at CIA or at Texas A&M or in the Defense Department. And, and my concern that because of our polarized politics and the paralysis that we see, that young people would be cynical about going into public service. You know, it's, it's just a mess. Why would I get involved in that? And, and what was especially tragic for me is I watched it at, particularly at Texas A&M, but I've seen it at William & Mary and elsewhere. It's young people in college today are more involved in volunteerism and in doing public service as college students than I think they've ever been before in history. And, and yet, when they get out of college, they tend to put all that behind them. And, and part of the book, part of the reason for the book, is to show young people that institutions can be reformed, can be changed. Because a lot of the reasons that young people don't go into government is because of the hierarchy, because of the bureaucracy, uh, because it's seen as stifling. And what I, what I try and point out in the book is that at these three very different places, I was able to change the bureaucracy. I was able to change things and make them better, uh, make them more user-friendly, make them more satisfying for the people who work there. So I hope through the book to encourage young people uh, to consider public service, if not as a full-time career, as some part of their, of their life. Uh, President Bush has said no, no life can be complete without uh, some measure of public service. Uh, the first President Bush, and I believe that. And you know, for a lot of students who are sitting there, as you said, you know, they're looking at the life in the public sector and kind of going, well, why would I do that? With all of the bureaucracy, red tape, and challenges that come into that, what would you say to them? as far as jumping into a career, what can they do to navigate that system and to create that change, to go in there and be that reformist in, you know, in the system? Well, I think you have to be, um, you have to have a certain measure of boldness. Um, I wrote my first article for an in-house publication at CIA on how we could improve our analysis of the Soviet Union two years after I'd been there. So 1970, so I'd been there two years. You can imagine how welcoming my supervisors were <laughs> when I was telling them with two years in how to do their jobs better. But, but you know, when you, you, you have to take measured risks 
And you have to figure out to, how to navigate your way through the bureaucracy. One of the things that I advise young people is that when they get that first job is to hang on to it for at least two to three years. Establish a reputation for competence, for innovative thinking, for doing the job really well and as well as for kind of character and integrity. And once you've established a reputation where people actually have begin to have a stake in your success because you're a proven quantity now, that's the point at which you can begin to take some chances and try new things and, and ask for new opportunities uh, from, uh, from bosses. Uh, but the first thing is, I mean, you can't do that six months in or a year in. You really have to establish a strong foundation first. And then, then you have the opportunity to try a lot of different things. And I think that you know, there's a lot of perception within the public sector for students that you know, career advancement or moving ahead can be very stifling or you know, be stifled, be limited, held back. In your experience, so you actually were given a promotion, I believe is at the CIA, above some other senior level folks and somebody took a chance on you. Can you talk a little bit about that experience and what you think you did to earn that? One of the things that's important, you know, I think a lot of young people know the importance of having a mentor. And, and my point to them is you, you need a lot of mentors. And as you grow and as you assume greater responsibilities, the mentor you had when you were brand new is not going to help you grow. You always need to be looking two or three levels ab above you. Who can teach me something? Who can, uh, who can I learn from? Who will help advance my career? And, and so I like to tell people that my first mentor was a GS-14 at CIA, and my last mentor was President of the United States. And the problem is if you, if you just rely on one mentor, then, then you're going to plateau wherever that person is. And if you want to keep growing, you need to, be, you need to keep looking up. And that, by the same token, that will uh, give you more visibility and more opportunity. But the other piece of it is, and, and this is what I did, was once you've established that foundation, the reputation, reputational foundation of being a, a very capable person, then take the opportunity to move around and get different kinds of experiences. The, I think that the main reason I became, was named Director of Central Intelligence was because in the nine years I spent at the White House, at the National Security Council, under four different presidents, I knew more about how presidents used intelligence than anybody else in the government. Because I'd seen four very different presidents, Richard Nixon, uh, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and then uh, first President Bush. And, and that, I think, played a big part in President Bush's decision to ask me to be, to nominate me to be Director of Central Intelligence. <clears throat> but I think, you know, and we're, the government is getting smarter about this, at least at the federal level. And one of the things the military for doing, is doing, for example, is taking young officers and giving them the chance to go to graduate school or to serve an internship or a year in a, in a company, in a tech company or something like that. Um, so I think, I think taking advantage of these opportunities to get diverse experiences, and, I, and it will follow you all the way through your career. I would tell four-star generals, I will not appoint you to be a combatant commander, the commander of central command or strategic command, because you've only done one thing your whole career. You have no perspective outside of your narrow uh, uh, window of visibility. And I need somebody who's got broad perspective. So once you, again, establish that foundation, taking on different kinds of jobs that give you a broader perspective and more uh, diversity of experience in almost every organization, that will serve you well in the long run. So you have a student who builds a foundation, stays two or three years in their role, finds a mentor, starts moving around strategically to get that experience. One of the things you cover really well in your book is the limitations outside of their control, elected bodies within the public sector that can be a challenge. So can you talk about you know, the impact of elected bodies on the public sector, but then 
more importantly, how students can kind of navigate through that. So the key is figuring out how you or your boss can get, the, get public opinion on your side by doing things or framing the changes you want to make in a way that is so self-evidently beneficial to the public that it's very hard to oppose. Sometimes you're going to be able to get these people on your side. And one of the things that I have found in dealing with elected officials in particular is you often end up in front of them when something has gone wrong. And, and the best way to deal with it, and it's very hard for them to, to counter, is to go in, sit down, say, here's what went wrong, here's the problem, here's why it happened, and here's what I'm doing to fix it. Because then all they can say is, well, yeah, go do that. <laughs> I mean, they can keep coming back at you. Why did this happen? And, so on, and you can always say, well, as I said, mm -hmm. and then you just repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. but, but if you grab the bull by the horns, as it were, if you take charge of the problem and say, here's what happened, and here's how I'm going to fix it, it basically doesn't give them any place to go. You take that responsibility. You take that accountability and it takes that wind out of their sails. And you also take all their talking points. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so you have a leader who has you know, stepped in. They're navigating the system around. One of the things that you focus on a lot are the tactics in being an effective leader within the public sector. And a unique part that I pulled from your book was about task force. You know, the, the use of them and what you did with at Texas A&M about culture, but then also the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Can you talk about what task force are, but then how they can be managed efficiently and effectively towards an end goal? Yeah, one of my favorite quotes is that uh, a committee is a cul-de-sac down which ideas are lured and then quietly strangled. <laughs> and, but I think that part of the problem with almost every organization is that vertical communication, especially... Uh, well, up and down works pretty well, but there's often very little lateral communication across different elements of an organization. So forming some kind of an odd, odd hope committee or a task force, allow, it, I call them silo busters, because it makes people from different parts of an organization talk to each other who normally wouldn't have an interaction with each other. And collectively, they can often come up with some really good ideas on how to fix problems. And, and you will establish relationships uh, across the organization that last after the task force has gone away. Now, I believe task forces need to be um, very short in duration uh, for the most part. When I was director of Central Intelligence, I took over six weeks before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I had to redirect the entire intelligence community away from the singular focus on the Soviet Union and, and the Cold War to a very different world. At one point, I had 24 different task forces operating simultaneously on every aspect of the intelligence business. But the longest deadline any of them had was three months. If the longer you go, the worse the product. And you definitely do not want consensus. Consensus is an idea killer. And, and a lot of people spend endless hours in meetings trying to get consensus. It's a waste of time. The key is to sharpen differences so that whoever's in charge can then make decisions and make choices. But task forces, I, there are a couple of task forces when I was Secretary of Defense that I kept for quite a while. One was uh, tr trying to get immediate uh, capabilities into the hands of the troops to deal with IEDs and <clears throat> other uh, challenges where we needed solutions in weeks or days not years and so I kept that task force in being because the Department of Defense is so huge and so many different parts of the department are involved in any decision that there's actually only one person who can bring them all together knock heads and make a decision, and that's the secretary. Because everybody has their finger in the pie, and you've got to figure out how to bring them together, get the information you need, and then make a decision, and then make everybody go away and do their job. And, and so I, I use task forces a lot, uh, but as I say, 
Nine times out of ten, they need to have very short deadlines, do not go for consensus. Uh, and the other virtue of task forces is to make sure you construct them in a way that the people who are going to have to implement the decisions are part of the task force because they will ensure that the solutions are actually workable because they've got to be the ones to go do it once the task force is done and the decision is made. So if you have people involved in the task force who are going to have to actually implement it, it helps make the results more practical and, and more workable. And you know, it's really a new concept, I think, for a lot of young student leaders in thinking about you know, going into an organization, creating that kind of change, but then how to do that and getting those task force, getting the right players at the table. Um, There's a lot of uh, training programs or leadership programs and so on. It's in companies, in universities, you name it, in the military on how to, uh, how to improve group dynamics, how to uh, build teams, how to work together, and so on and so forth. That's all good, and that's all very important. But every young person needs to know that at some point, they're going to have to stand alone, that they will have to make a decision that may be unpopular, that people won't like, won't agree with, and because they have the responsibility, they have to make that decision. And they're going to have to stand all alone. Or people will be wanting to do something in a way that that young person knows is wrong or is unethical. And, and at that point, you have to plant your feet and say, this is wrong or this is not the right thing to do, and I'm not going to be a part of it. And you have to prepare yourself for that. You can't, you don't suddenly develop that kind of character and integrity at 50 years old. It begins even while you're in college, but in, in your jobs as a young person. And you know, you don't want to be self-righteous about it, but at a certain point you will face those choices. When I made the decision to reduce the medevac time in Afghanistan, from two hours to one hour. There wasn't a single senior person in uniform or civilian in the Department of Defense who supported that. And the reason was, I mean, they weren't harsh, I mean, they weren't being cruel, but their view was statistically it really wouldn't matter very much in terms of the number of people who survived. My attitude was this is a matter of moral obligation and morale. And only years later did we discover that it probably also saved somewhere north of 500 lives. Wow. What an impact. And so getting that student who's young in their career and getting them to the point where they are feeling confident enough, um, what can, how can students approach the leadership training that they're going into? You know, whether it's an organization like ours, the society where they're building those skills, or any organization. How can they maximize those opportunities as they're seeking them out? Well, I think, I think partly it's by observing other people. It's by observing people who have been successful leaders and the lessons learned from that. It's by observing and talking to their friends and peers, uh, to their professors, to administrators at the college. I mean, there are, there are a lot of, it's, it's mainly about what, I, what, what in the intelligence business they call situational awareness. It's being aware of what's going on around you and learning from every piece of the environment uh, that, that over time gives you those skills. And, and the key is, in, in particularly in these kinds of programs and others, is through exercises or through student government or something, just getting some experience in doing these things. Last question for you. You know, I want to bring you back to the book. There's so many different tips, so many different tactics. You know, when I was going through it and actually reading it, where you're taking them through vision, strategic thinking, attention to implementation, transparency. What do you want people to take away from this book? Beyond the tactics, beyond what you are giving them as tools, what do you want them to take away from this book? I think the major message in the book is that people, not systems, make change and make the world better. And, and how you treat people is important. How you deal with people, um, how you take care of people who work for you and with you, how you look out for their interests, 
how you keep your ego under control. But it's all about understanding the people around you and treating them as colleagues and people who are valued, uh, whose, whose work is valued, and if they're subordinates, empowering them. So it's all about, uh, if, there, if there's one underlying theme in the book, is that it's, at the end of the day, it's all about people. I'll give you one example of the importance of little gestures of respect. It was at the end of the Camp David negotiations for Middle East peace between Egypt and Israel. And the National Security Advisor, Spignat Brzezinski, and I flew into Cairo a day ahead of President Carter to nail down the final details with President Anwar Sadat of Egypt. Now this was um, close to 40 years ago. And to this day, I will never forget Brzezinski introducing me to President Sadat as his colleague. Not his aide, not his uh, staff person, but as his colleague. Just a tiny gesture of respect. But all the things that I've done in my life, I remember that to this day. So never underestimate the importance of small gestures of respect and of empowering people uh, as you navigate your way uh, uh, through your career. What a great exclamation point and period to put on the end of that last question. Thank you so much for that. To our leaders and viewers, we hope that you've enjoyed your time in hearing the story and the tips from Dr. Robert Gates. And on behalf of our national organization, on behalf of 500 colleges and our 600,000 members, we want to present you as an honorary member of the National Society of Leadership and Success. Thank you for joining us Thank here you today. Very much. And to our leaders watching, we want to encourage you, as you take that next step towards your own success, we want to encourage you to make sure that you're also taking into account being a leader who makes a better world. Until next time, thank you.